but welcome to this beautiful spot where we're going to talk about very ugly things indeed, and in this peaceful place discuss hideous deeds of violence and uh, the ugly aspect of the Victorian age. In case you're wondering which of us is which, um, I'm Jack. He's Jack and I'm the Ripper. But <laughs> I'm the one who wrote about the Victorians and I'm called A.N. Wilson and he's the one that we're actually come to listen to today. Um, he's called Bruce Robinson. If your household is like mine, his most famous film, With Snail and I, has become part of your inner furniture and you probably know whole scenes of it by heart. But he's an actor, he's a filmmaker of genius and he's also uh, an absolutely wonderful historian, as is witnessed by this very heavy book, which shows how strong I am to be able to hold it up. Um, they all love Jack. Some of you might be ripperologists, as they say in the trade, but there are others probably here today who don't actually remember or even know the story of the Whitechapel murders, which the first of which was, I think I'm right in saying, September 1888, isn't that right? Correct. So, Bruce, if you can just take us through what people were hearing about um, in London in 1888, coming out sure. of the East End, and tell us also a little bit about London, which uh, in its West End was the richest city in the world, and in the East End, where these horrible crimes took place, was a place uh, of appalling poverty and misery. That is also correct. Um, yeah, hi everyone. It was uh, uh, London in 1888 was bar none the richest city in the world. And as uh, uh, Andrew's just said, in the east end of it was the poorest city in the world. Uh, in the uh, 18th century, the English used the excuse of, of something called the Black Hole of Calcutta to uh, invade India virtually, and forgive me, my Indian history isn't too good, but the Black Hole of Calcutta was something that really stimulated the British into action. But if they'd wanted black holes, they could have got on a bus, a penny bus ride into the east end of London and found as many black holes as they'd wanted, because there were people living there 20, 30 to a room with sewerage seeping up through the, the floorboards. It was the most disgusting area probably I in Europe. Cut to the West End of London, which was, as just been said, the richest area. Into this area, this poverty-struck area, in the autumn of 1888, uh, came this, this psychopath. He was, a, he was a, in a way, the first of his kind, or rather he was the first of his kind in this historical time because a lot of new things were happening. We were seeing the beginning of trade unionism, the beginning of republicanism, the desire, uh, we were seeing an educated populace. We were s the beginning of the telephone in 1888, for example. You could telephone to Paris from London. In 1888, an event was taking place in the East End of London, it would be on the front page next mor morning of the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times. So the telegraph, the telephone, education, mass media coincided with this, this psychopath. So it was possible, in other words, to become a celebrity criminal, which is partly what you're talking Th about. That's exactly and right. A lot of these, as we know now, a lot of these serial killers, a motivation for it, apart from the extraordinary psychopathic desire to cause pain and misery to their fellow human beings is to have fame and notoriety. That's right. They like it. They love it, as a matter of fact. And this guy really adored it. And so just a thumbnail of what he did. In September, they find a woman in the east end of London. And I'm afraid I need to repeat what he did to these victims, which will make sense in a moment. They found a woman in the east end of London with her throat cut across, her stomach ripped open and her, her entrails extracted. About two weeks later, another woman was found with her th throat cut across, her stomach ripped open and her entrails taken out and dumped on her left shoulder. Uh, about a week after that, two women were murdered on the same night. The first one, Elizabeth Stride, 
had her throat cut across, but he was disturbed, the murderer, and he left the, the uh, area. He, ha he, he, had a, he had a costume under coming along that's the dark right. alley, didn't he? He was disturbed by a guy arriving with his horse and cart in this darkness, and he had to run for it, or walk for it, rather, and he walked from uh, the east end of London, London into the city of London, where he ran into another little sweetheart, uh, Catherine Eddowes, who he took into a place called Mitre Square, and he really went to town on her, and the woman who had escaped his attentions, Elizabeth Stride, at the last murder, all of what she didn't get, this woman got. And he eviscerated her, he cut her throat across, he took her entrails out and threw them over her shoulder, he removed every bit of silver and money from her body and ritualistically put it around her body as he had the previous woman. He'd put all the metal that was on her, at her feet. This, ri this cut, ripping open and cutting across the throat and removing metal was clearly a ritual. Can I just ask you one question? Sure. Uh, sorry to interrupt this no, no, no. gruesome narrative, but were there any marks that he made on the women's bodies at this stage? There were. In could you, could you the, tell us what they were? Well, the one I'm just talking about, the reason I... He, t he took this woman into a place called Mitre Square, and he drew two compasses, this wild, vicious slashing and cutting, but these very controlled compasses on each cheek. So that they, the, the women's faces, they would like ladies that. and gentlemen, when the, when the police arrived, had these compass shapes uh, gouged onto their cheeks. Yes. I think that's a very important part of your story for later on. That's yes, yes, it certainly but is. carry on. <coughs> so we have the compasses on the square, in Mitre Square. After uh, the so-called double event uh, that night, the Ripper uh, cut out his victim's kidney and wrapped it in a piece of her apron. The, these ladies wore huge aprons, 12 feet square. He cut off a piece of her apron and took her kidney away in this apron back into the Metropolitan Police District where he kept the kidney but dumped the apron in a, in a doorway, a black doorway, and he wrote on the wall, the Jews, J-U-W-E-S, are not the men to be blamed for nothing. This, this had an enormous significance that we'll come to in a moment or a little later. Can you just say that sentence again, because it's such a strange sentence. I think it would be good if we had it in our, yes. in our heads, because there's a double negative. It is the Jews, J-U-W-E-S, are not the men to be blamed for nothing. He then left through the piece of apron under the writing and evaporated into the myth of Jack the Ripper, this great mystery. Who the hell was it? Here come the police down uh, to the East End, there was a, the uh, commissioner of Metropolitan Police was a man called Sir Charles Warren. He'd never been to the East End before for any of the other murders, there were three or four before this one, and he came racing down to the East End at 4.30 in the morning in his carriage, not to investigate the murders, but to extirpate, to wipe out this piece of writing on the wall. The city police who had this body of Catherine Eddowes came roaring in to Warren, the commissioner of the city police, saying, you can't do this, you can't wipe this out. It's vital evidence. And Warren said, no, it's the Jews. He's trying to incite some race relation, you know... Um, Anti-Semitic uh, riots anti -Semitic or something. Anti-Semitic riots like and all of that kind of nonsense. This is a time, ladies and gentlemen, when everybody was poor in the East End, but the Jews tended, from about 1870, 80 onwards, to have made a little bit more money than some of the others and to be the landlords. And That's so they right. were hated because they put up the rents and these people who were living in 20 or 30 uh, individuals per room were having to pay their poor pence uh, to the Jews. That was one of the... Uh, and they were pretty well hated by the establishment. Yes. They were, uh, you know, they were vilified in the press all the time and, you know, being a Jew in London at that time was a bad thing to be. So the police were trying to unload uh, 
these crimes onto the Jewish community. So the Jews are not the men to be blamed for nothing. It was rather easy for Sir Charles Warren to say this is an anti-Semitic piece of scribble and it's got to be, it's got to be washed out. The city police were also there saying, no, we must photograph this very important piece of evidence. And an argument took place for half an hour between the City of London Police and the Metropolitan Police. And because it was on the turf of the Metropolitan Police, the Metropolitan Police won, and they took this, rubbed this writing out. And it was never recorded except in one of the policemen's notebooks. Three weeks later, there was another, the most dreadful murder of them all to date. Uh, and this was the, the first and only one that actually took place inside uh, a, a, a room. The, the Ripper picked up this woman uh, in uh, the morning of the 9th of November, 1888, and went back to her room with her and literally, literally took her to pieces and hung parts of her body all over the, all over the room uh, he cut her face off, he cut one of her legs off, he took her heart away with him, uh, and then here come the police again, what the hell, you know, we better get some dogs to try and trace. Every single case had the same signature, murderous signature, that the police were incapable of recognizing what this ritual stood for. So what did it stand for? That's where my research started. May I just interrupt? We've brought up to the point of the, uh, the murders and the rituals, but I just, without um, being indelicate, I want to concentrate on one aspect of Victorian London which would have surprised all of you, I'm sure, if we went back in a time machine and visited it. Um, if you just see Victorian London through the eyes of two foreign visitors, if I may just... George, very, 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 very quickly say, uh, both from Russia and both novelists, when Dostoevsky went to London, the thing which first struck him and which absolutely appalled him, although of course he'd seen the great Russian cities of St. Petersburg and Moscow, was the number of women selling their bodies on the streets of London. Yeah. And as he came into, the, uh, this isn't just in the poor districts, as he came down the Haymarket where um, there were splendid theatres and bright lights, um, and it's only a step away from Leicester Square, whether in those days it was far less sordid and uh, messy than it is now. And then uh, the uh, Pall Mall and all these wonderful great streets with the gentlemen's clubs. Uh, it was teeming, as, as thick as this um, area today, with young women um, who are offering themselves for a few pence or a few shillings. And... Uh, that was Dostoevsky's vision of England, and he was appalled by it. And uh, the English seem to be particularly good at this uh, business of, on the one hand, leading lives of absolute domestic rectitude uh, and living in beautiful suburbs, and on the other hand, seemingly dependent on these women for keeping the surface of family life, so-called, together. And uh, the, the other Russian novelist, of course, uh, who visited London very famously was Tolstoy, and he, with a surprising degree of cynicism, given his um, deep seriousness about life, <coughs> commented on the fact that the reason that British family life was so much more stable than Russian family life was that the men, when they'd um, ceased to feel in love with their wives, didn't conduct indiscreet affairs as the upper classes did and the lower classes did, but the respectable bourgeoisie went out and bought these women. And that is part of the story. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, I'm yes, very certain certainly certain that this is part of the story because, um, the, uh, as you know, William Blake, a hundred years before, said that the harlots cry from street to street um, will weave old England's winding sheet. And this <laughs> lyric comes to my mind in almost every page that Bruce has written. But well, go back to the ritual now, and we've got well, these poor dead women on the streets. Well, all of the women that were killed by the Ripper thus far were all whores, you know, and I don't say that in a pejorative sense. They were, they were, they were fourpenny prostitutes. Uh, they'd go out and, and screw against a wall for four pennies to hire a bed to sleep in. There were 48,000 estimated active prostitutes in London's East End. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's 
quite phenomenal. Just what Andrew's just said. Every other lady there, because of the poverty of their time, had nothing to sell but themselves, you know, and for the price of a cup of tea. This was a time when Vic Victorian period, when British hypocrisy, which is still very much with us, was at its apogee. This was the most hypocritic nation on earth. One of the things that they were very fond of saying was, oh, Jack the Ripper couldn't possibly be in an Englishman. It has to be a foreigner. It's probably an eye tie. It's almost certainly a Jew. It was a time when the British were killing hundreds of thousands of foreigners all over the world, but it couldn't have been an Englishman, but it was one. Um, Go back now to this to, last corpse that you described, yeah, and so that, you, you were about to tell us why you found significance in the ritual arrangement. That's exactly right, And yeah. also why the police, most notably and shockingly, failed to find significance. Had our favorite detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, been asked down to the East End, he would have immediately noticed the similarity between the uh, murders uh, and, the in, rich, and the ritual nature of the killing. As indeed did uh, Sir Charles Warren, who yes. was the chief of Metropolitan Police. He was also one of the world's most prominent Freemasons. He opened the first lodge of Masonic research, the Quattro Caranati in London, in the world. He was a top-end Freemason, and so was Jack the Ripper. So, in my research, I was looking, is this a, was this a Buddhist thing? Is it a Hindu thing? Is it a Christian science thing? Is it a Freemasonic thing, the way these women are being killed? And indeed it was. We go back to the Freemasonic ritual of my throat being cut across if I reveal Masonic secrets, my entrails being hauled out and thrown over my shoulder, my body cut in two uh, and left outside the, 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 uh, the uh, city gates and all my silver and jewelry taken from my body. So I, I had, this was a lot, it took 15 years to write this book, and it took me six, seven months before I realized what these police were looking at. So now I had like a little root coming out of the, the ground that I knew that the Ripper was either a Freemason or pretending to be a Freemason. Added to which, remember ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the V's. These, the, the, the compasses of the architect that's were right. put, on, put on the face. The archetypal Masonic sign is the compasses on the square. He took this woman to Mitre Square and cut the compasses in her face. So any Freemason would recognize this symbolism instantly. Warren and all his team of senior detectives were all in, in the Freemasonic movement, all of them. They couldn't see the masonry or rather, let me rephrase that, they could see the masonry, but they were duty-bound to cover it up. And that is the, be the beginning of the so-called mystery of Jack the Ripper. So like I was saying, I had this little sort of white weed sticking up through the earth of Freemasonry. And I got hold of it and started pulling it, and this enormous system started coming up through the sand, through the earth, through London. Of, of Freemasonry, and it was interconnected with the, the most superior people in British society. The king to be, Edward VII, was the most important Freemason in the world. I then, at this point, I couldn't investigate the Ripper because I didn't know he was at this point. Excuse but, me, but, but you're not suggesting that Edward VII was Jack the Ripper? No, no, certainly not. Because there were people, I mean, he there are many... Jack, he was Jack the Shagger. He was Jack the Shagger. Edward the Caresser, as he was known. Yes. But um, there are people, of course, uh, this is the ripperologist of all ripperologists, but there are ripperologists who believe that a member of the royal family was involved with this case. So if you could just get that piece of, I think, nonsense out of the way. That, that, that's true. Uh, a man called Stephen Knight in the 1970s published a, a very... Um, a very dramatically received, shall I say, a book called The Final Solution that accused the Duke of Clarence, who was Edward VII's son, of being Jack the Ripper. He was Queen Victoria's grandson. He was a fey little 
they, they called him collars and cuffs. He had an enormously long neck. He had an, a tire pressure IQ. It was a complete dope in every way. But he was accused of being the ripper by Stephen Knight. Stephen Knight had got his information on Clarence out of supposedly secret files owned by Scotland Yard. And it's palpable nonsense. It's quite ridiculous, this. So I went to Scotland Yard and started researching this, and they said, yes, it's all in the files. So I said, well, the, the files that Knight saw, why aren't they in the public record office? And they said, oh, well, because they're, they're still secret. And I said, well, how did Knight see them then? It, it was just, oh, well, the, the man over here, you know, was talking to the man over there type of stuff. It was all bollocks. So I didn't, didn't mean to say bollocks, but I have so, so said it again. <laughs> um, Never mind. You're absolved. I'm but sorry, I'm <laughs> absolved from saying that. It was all rubbish. So I wanted to know where this ridiculous myth had come from about the Duke of Clarence. And I started to research that. And you go back and back and back to its first appearance. It first appeared at the Athenaeum Club in London, where a very f famous crime writer, Colin Wilson, was invited to lunch by a man, a man called Stoll, Dr. Dr. Stoll, Thomas Stoll, who told him this story. Stoll told him about, about uh, a, a, a surgeon called Gull, who apparently, in reality, was too ill to get out of bed. He'd had a stroke. But Gull and Clarence and this driver called Netley gallop off to the East End, kill these women. I mean, Gull was 76 years old and half paralyzed. I mean, it could, all absolute nonsense. Uh, Colin Wilson didn't buy this, this uh, story at all and said, I don't want anything to do with it. So Stoll then published it in a, in a book in Paris in 1962, came out in French. That didn't take off either. Uh, and then he published the story again in The Criminologist, which is a true crime magazine in London, where it gained some traction. And the Sunday Times of London said, oh, did the Ripper have royal blood? As soon as the Sunday Times published this article, Stowell wrote to the Times and said, I never said that. This is ridiculous, even though it was in print in, in, in The Criminologist. So I started going after this Dr. Stowell guy. Who was he? Well, what he was was a very, very senior Freemason. And the reason he'd done this was to inoculate the Ripper against Freemasonry. In other words, someone like Knight comes along, believes the Freemasonic angle of the Ripper story, publishes it, and looks like a banana. And it warns everybody off of going after Freemasonry. And it did, until I came along. You know, anyone who said that the Ripper had anything to do with Freemasonry was laughed at, and, and still is laughed at. I mean, the, the uh, Freemasons went after this, uh, this guy, Stephen Knight, in the most vicious and nasty way because they were on safe ground. They knew he was wrong. They, the Masons have not said one word about my 900 page, not a word about this book. And the reason I haven't said a word is because it's true. Well, um, obviously, the, the book presumably was published not only in, in Britain but in America, I imagine. Yes. I and I imagine a great success there. I have to be cautious. You have to be cautious. I do. I genuinely do. I've been told to be. So you mustn't say anything? I mustn't say anything. Did you get a lot of good reviews in America? One. <laughs> I got one review. The, the publishers in America um, refused to allow the book to be reviewed, although my contract said, I'm not going to tell you why this happened, but I'll tell you what happened. Although my contract said it was to come out in paperback as it has in, in England, the uh, American publishers shut down the publication of the paperback. They also refused to allow it to be reviewed in any newspaper except one American newspaper where it was vilified, and this newspaper was owned by a gentleman called Rupert Murdoch. Am I right in remembering that Rupert Murdoch is a member of a Masonic Lodge? You may be right about that. Mm. I, I wouldn't say it myself, yes. but you could be right. Anyway, you, you know things I don't. I'd, I think some people in the audience know things we don't. Yeah, he's now, a, ra a raving Freemason. Let's go back a little bit. I think. Because we needn't dwell on the painful subject of Rupert Murdoch. 
Um, let's, let's return to the comparatively salubrious subject of Jack the Ripper. And can you just take us through some of the pet theories that people have had? We've already had the Duke of Clarence, which I agree with you is absolute rubbish. Mm. Um, th there have been endless books written about this series of peculiar crimes. Uh, before getting on to your most shocking revelation, of course, is that they're not peculiar at all, no. which is what I want you really to say to them. But can, can you just, as briefly as it's possible, because we've now got through a, half a few of the theories. Some of the theories about who he, assuming it was he, was. Well, I mean, it's been everybody, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, down to Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. Anyone, basically, who went into the East End in 1888 has been picked on as a Jack the Ripper candidate. Most of these books I discovered in my research, they're written by people who nominate themselves as Ripperologists. But I renamed them Freemasologists because I started researching them. And they're all bloody Freemasons. And so they're saying, let's put this cardboard armor up here and someone will lock that down, and here up pops another one, you know, and he's an expert on Jack. They know bugger all about it, except the ones... Are you Joe Jane? Oh, I said bugger. They, they I didn't mean to say bugger. They know I did beg your pardon. Ladies and gentlemen, block your ears. They know very little about it, but anyway, I'm, I'm sort of quite well known in my own country for swearing a bit, and every time I ever talk on the BBC, they say, that absolutely, you can't swear. And, uh, and I try not to very much. It's actually cramping my style a bit. No, it's not. Your, st your style is uh, inimitable, so it can't, cramp, can't be cramped. No, I'm cramped. I'm well cramped. <laughs> but go on, because we're, we're, uh, I'm, so I'm gripped, and I'm sure they're gripped. So, so all of these, these Freemasologists keep coming up. You know, my grandfather was a surgeon at London Hospital, and we found his knives in the attic. He must have been Jack the Ripper. So here we go, and then there's another book out and there's a bit more camouflage. Um, no one wants to really address who he was and the senior Freemasons today in London know perfectly well who he was. They knew who he was in 1888 and they know who he is today. Who is, is he? Who is he? He's a man called Michael Maybrick. This is the most extraordinary part of the story. Michael Maybrick who nobody now has ever heard of, was the most famous singer-composer of the 19th century. He composed a song called The Holy City, which was the biggest selling song in the whole of the 19th century. The man was extremely wealthy, extremely famous. He was more famous than, say, Gilbert and Sullivan. Massively outsold Gilbert and Sullivan. And uh, now, you'd, in the, the great musical dictionary is like, Grove's Dictionary of Music and Musicians, which is a three million word, 12 volume thing. You won't find this guy in there. You won't find him anywhere. Black's Dictionary of Music, none of them. He was extirpated. He, he was taken out of his Masonic lodges. He was in a, an outfit called the Artist's Rifles that used to uh, meet in, in Toynbee Hall in the East End of London, which we'll get on to in a moment. Uh, Everything about him, he was a prominent member of the Arts Club, he was a member of the Athenaeum, where indeed the, uh, the director, uh, the uh, commissioner of Metropolitan Police was actually a club member with him. He was a member of the Savage Club, where the, the, the uh, commissioner of Metropolitan Police was also a member. He was right bang smack in the middle of the establishment, this guy. As a matter of fact, he was in the same Masonic Lodge as the king-to-be, Edward VII, who was then the Prince of Wales. He was in there. He was like one of us. Are you saying to us that these people suspected him, not just a Mason, but him, of being Jack the Ripper? Not, not at quite at this point. No. Not quite at this point. But the other thing that the Ripper did, and all these, these Ripperologists will tell you that all the letters that Jack the Ripper sent into the police. He taunted the police constantly. He called, he called what he did his funny little game. Uh, they will tell you that they're all forgeries. They're fakes. They're nitwits sending in letters to harass and hassle the police. That must, to be fair to the police, that must often happen when there's a crime. I mean, we know when the so-called Yorkshire Ripper was murdering women all over Yorkshire uh, it does. 30 years ago. There were hoaxers who thought it would be amusing 
to send in these letters to the police. Indeed, they did, the tape. But hoaxers can't send in random letters from all over the country with the same joke on the front because he used to write on these letters, sometimes in beautiful copper plate, sometimes in sort of Neanderthal scrawl, on Her Majesty's service, on these envelopes. Now, how would a hoaxer joking in Edinburgh be able to replicate what a hoaxer joking in Bristol was doing? And this was the reason they were allowed to say they were hoaxes, because how could one person be sending these letters from all over the country? Today, we would say, Oh, well, maybe he's an airplane pilot, maybe he's a long-distance lorry driver and he's getting into a new town and sending them. Who else could possibly be doing it? Well, in the 19th century, with the best railway service in the world, somebody else who could be doing it is a concert performer who is moving from town to town to warble away to the audience and sing his songs. So one night he's in Bristol, the next night he's in Manchester, the next night he's in Leeds, then he's back to Edinburgh, then he's down to London. And I got on to, who I'll explain why I did in a moment, I got on to this particular guy, Michael Maybrick, who was, a, who was a, obviously a concert singer and a famous singer, famous composer, and I started to try and match the letters to the known dates of his tours in England, where he was singing. Here comes the Jack the Ripper letter from Manchester, Michael Maybrick was singing in Manchester that night. Here comes one in Bristol. Michael Maybrick was singing in Bristol. And it became, it became really quite startling. That was but, the moment in your book where I'd been thinking of, steady on, this is a conspiracy theory. It's going a little bit nutty, quite honestly. And then when, when you got to that point, I was convinced. Sure. Because I, I, I couldn't see any particular reason why a hoaxer would be in the same place uh, as Michael Maybrick well, at the same time. Well, the other thing about it, of course, is that not only were these hoaxers using the same joke on the envelope, they were also talking about the same thing, because every, th these hoaxers didn't live in the cities they were writing from. They would say things like, I've arrived in the slogging town of Birmingham, but I'm off to Bradford tomorrow. And then you get a letter from Bradford saying, here in Bradford, everything's pretty dull, I might kill a couple of women, don't know if I see one, I've seen one I quite like the look of, I think I will kill her, hee hee, ha ha, also that, or maybe I won't because I've got to go to Manchester. So all of these hoaxes were saying the same thing. They were all on the move, like an enormous team of Jack the Rippers moving through the provinces all the time. And, and it was untenable, and I realized it had to be one man, but one man who had a facility to change his handwriting. Was there, was there a precedent for that? Yes, there was. There was a very famous psychopath in the 20th century called John George Haig, who was the acid bath murderer, who Scotland Yard said in, in 1950s, this is the greatest forger we've ever seen. He could look at somebody's handwriting, just look at it, and write like it and copy it. It was amazing, and he killed nine women in, in, the, in the late 50s. So I was thinking my guy, Maybrick, may have this same facility. Now I've got to try and find his, his handwriting, and it was very, very difficult because everything's been destroyed. But one letter turned up in America, signed Jack the Ripper, taunting the police to watch closely around Conduit Street. Now, Conduit Street is a very expensive street near Bond Street in London's West End, and nothing to do with the slimy old East End where he was bumping them off. So I thought, why would someone calling himself Jack the Ripper write a letter saying, look around Conduit Street? This was all painstaking research, obviously, as you will understand. I started researching Conduit Street, and this isn't a swear word, but bugger me, who had a pied a terre in Conduit Street but Michael Maybrick? He lived in Conduit Street. And I, my hair was standing on end, you know, this guy was so flagrant in the way he was treating the police and the authorities. He said, come on, come and get me. This is my funny, come and, come and get me. But Why they, didn't they? Why because didn't they come and get him? of who he was. We have a thing going on at the moment in England called the Hillsborough scandal, where 90 Liverpool fans were unlawfully killed at a football game. 
and the police subsequent to this football game said, oh, the fans were all drunk, they were urinating on the dying bodies, they were picking their pockets. They were and, and this is the absolute opposite was the truth. It was the fault of the coppers, but they drew in their ranks, and for 33 years, they were saying it was the fans' fault. We finally found out, and the police have been found guilty of doing this. There's a very minor example of what was going on with Jack the Ripper. They could not catch him because they were catching themselves. They were catching an enterprise wherein 10,000 people ran the world. The British Empire had 360 million subjects in it, all of whom, all the viceroys in India here were all Freemasons. Their secretaries were Freemasons. Everyone in the press, the judiciary in London, were Freemasons. So oh, now you're saying not that this every, Surely not everyone, everyone in the press trying to be the Freemason. Senior figures, the editor of the Telegraph, the yeah. Freemason. Editor of the Times, the Freemason. W.T. Stead. Hmm? W.T. Stead, the editor. Stead was not a Freemason. He was not a Freemason. He no. was the most famous editor in London. Yeah, at the well, time. the Review who, of Reviews. Who exposed the scandal of child prostitution, for example. Th that's, that's quite right. I mean, we're talking about a time, 1888, where you, excuse me, using uh, an expletive, you could fuck a child for five shillings, but you couldn't read Emil Zola. And anyone who read Emil, Emil Zola could go to prison. That Why? Is, that the, is true, and it is... An extraordinary fact that Stead, uh, ridiculous as he was in his personal life, he uncovered this fact that you could uh, buy an imported child. They were usually imported from Belgium. The Belgian police ran a racket of selling these children to uh, senior doctors in Harley Street who had padded cells at the back of their um, palatial surgeries where you could go and kill the child and then it would be disposed of with no questions asked by the police. Isn't so that's, I mean, that, and that is an absolutely attested fact, which is yeah. uh, one of the things which led to the uh, raising of the age of consent in Victorian Britain. Yeah, and the age of consent in Victorian Britain was 12 years old. This was voted by a parliament of all men. There were no women in there. Um, this, was at a, this was at a time when they were up to the most disgusting stuff. I mean, particularly in the country we're in now, but more than anywhere, in Ireland, I mean, quite phenomenal what was going on. There was the Republican leader of Ireland, I'd just do this in two sentences, was a man called Parnell, and Parnell was trying to cut free from the British as India was uh, 90 years later. He was trying for home rule. He wanted his own parliament uh, in Ireland and for the Irish to govern themselves. The head of Metropolitan Police in London, CID, was a man called Sir Robert Anderson. And in 1887 and 1888, these articles were appearing in the Times newspaper called Parnalism and Crime and Behind the Scenes in America. These were serialized in the, in the Times newspaper. Here comes Sir Robert Anderson and says, these are disgusting crimes. Here is Parnell associated with terrorists blowing up the English, killing the English Viceroy Cavendish in the Phoenix Park, very famous murder. This man, Parnell, is a disgrace. How dare he even conceive of ruling Ireland when he writes this stuff and does this stuff? It finally transpired that the person who had written all this shit in the Times was the head of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Robert Anderson. So he was trying to prosecute Parnell for that that he had created. That's how corrupt this particular area of Victorian society was. Now, I want you to go on a bit because if you can uh, stand it, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, your stomachs turning over, I want you to be able to participate in this and ask some questions. But before we do that, I want you to explain to us, Bruce, first of all, at what stage you think the police actually really knew it was Maybrick. And secondly, we only know, uh, those of us who haven't read your book, we only know of the, the named victims of the so-called Jack the Ripper murders, but in this mm. book, you actually contend he probably killed, how many do you think? Uh, over 30 people. They, co they considered correctly, by the way, the, the authorities of the day, that if we keep these murders in the east end of London, where all the dross lives, nobody's going to get too excited about it. If the Ripper was moving out into the west end and putting the 
daughters and wives of rich people on the, on the mortuary slab, we, we've got a problem. But while he's operating in the East End, if we can keep him in the East End, nobody's going to care too much. And that was the truth of it. You know, 2,000 children in Africa will probably die today for filthy water, mosquitoes. We don't really hear that kind of news too much. And the East End was a different country, a different world to the West End. Uh, and presumably, I, don't, I hope this isn't cod psychology, but presumably the shame felt by bourgeois, respectable England, all of whom knew that most of the things we've said today are true, um, actually hated these women. Yes, they did. They, they needed to hate them, rather as crypto homosexuals hate homosexuals and don't kill them. Um, men who were using these women um, to preserve the res respectability of their family lives but there were letters wanted to them dead, really. There were letters to the Times newspaper where this vicious psychopath was referred to as a genius. He was a genius getting rid of the riffraff. And these were serious letters from serious people writing into the Telegraph and the Times and various other uh, uh, right-wing newspapers. And uh, just in brackets, I've been writing about Charles Darwin for the last few years. Anyone who's actually read his book, The Descent of Man, which turns into the most appalling rant against the lower classes, uh, and in particular the Irish and the Jews in the cities of Victorian England, it was his dream, uh, and in even more that of his cousin, Francis Galton, who invented the science of eugenics, that these people would eventually be eliminated altogether. Yeah, so taken they, out. Darwin and Galton and the Darwinians had this vision of a world which was pure and which could be um, free of these disgusting people. That's right. Anyway, just go back to your well, thing. And, and just uh, apropos of that, it must never be forgotten uh, that the horror of the concentration camp was an English invention. They invented it in South Africa in the Boer War. They couldn't beat the Boers, so they grabbed the w women and children. That's and true, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with I know it doesn't. I'm sorry, not so advancing let's, it. Let's get back I'm just to saying that they were such pricks. Because well, um, we've only got about 20 minutes left. If we get onto the Boer War, we'll be here till Thursday. I wouldn't mind getting onto the Boer War. No, I'd, I'd love it too, but it's a different, it's a different, it's a different movie. All right. So, where, where was I at last time? I where was, were you? I can't remember. <laughs> well. We've, we've got all these dead bodies. We've got the police, whom you are beginning to tell us, actually knew, and that's what I was going to ask oh. you. At what point do you think they actually knew who it was? They knew it was a Mason, obviously, because this guy was a Masonic expert. So they knew it was a Freemason. They knew in 1892 who, who this Freemason was. I'd just like so to... So four years after the first murder, yeah. there were people in Scotland Yard who had a perfectly clear idea. They, they knew exactly who he was. You can tell. And that's when he disappeared. He, he vanished from London society. Where did he go? He went to the Isle of Wight, where... It's a very good place to disappear. Queen Victoria had the same idea about 50 years before. A, and he was a pal of hers. There's a, a, there's a photograph of his wife. He was a homosexual, by the way. There's a photograph of his wife who was his monstrous old butcher's daughter. Steady who, on, steady on. <laughs> who was his housekeeper, and he married the slut because he... Steady because, on, even more. No, sorry, because the government had said to him, you've got to be married to somebody. So he didn't know any women. He was a rampant queen. And so the only woman he knew was his housekeeper. And he went off to the Isle of Wight and married her. And she used, she used to ride around in the carriage, and he'd walk behind he wouldn't even get in the bloody carriage with her well, because probably, he hated her so much. There's probably no room if you're ungallant enough to have told us. But, but anyway... Let, um, let me just explain how yeah. I got on to the Ripper, shall yes. I? Yes, do. Uh, be, being this guy, Please and then we'll do. come back to the 1892. Please do, and, and then I think our audience might like a word too. But, but get on to the Ripper. The, in in, in na 1991, in Liverpool, there was a thing, there was a journal discovered that... The, the ridiculously was called The Diary of Jack the Ripper, and it was published as complete nonsense, and subsequent to that, people are saying, oh, it's a forgery, or no, it's real, but if it is real, who wrote it? And this Liverpool cotton merchant called James Maybrick was the man who was figured to have written this book, um, who was murdered by his wife, apparently, Mrs. Maybrick, in the spring of 1890, uh, 1889. This, by the way, for those of you who 
have more wholesome minds than either of us and therefore don't read true crime all the time. This was a very, very famous murder case in late Victorian England. That's but right, it was. She was supposed to have bumped him off with arsenic, uh, but he was an arsenic addict, by the way, her husband. It would be like giving an alcoholic a teaspoon of gin to try and kill them. He'd have, if, if she tried to kill him with arsenic, he'd have swallowed the lot and said, got any more. He was literally that addicted to it. So I started looking at this guy, why, rather as I was talking about earlier with the Duke of Clarence, why is this associated with Jack the Ripper? So but why she, Mrs. This? Maybach was found guilty in the trial. Mrs. Maybach was sent to jail for 15 years. Yes, exactly. But carry on. The, the, his, Mr. Maybrick was actually murdered by his brother, a man called Michael Maybrick, who was Jack the Ripper. And he took great delight with his Masonic friends, he, a Masonic judge who actually wrote Indian law. He was here, his name was Fitz James Stevens. And he came out here, he was an opium addict, and he wrote modern English law in the 19th century for everyone to obey this complete bigoted bastard. He also wrote comic verse, if you remember. He wrote the famous tag about when the, uh, when the Rudyards ceased from Kipling and the Haggards ride no more. But um, <laughs> that's just in brackets. So, I mean, he was an amusing person to spend the evening with, but rather an unsalubrious character like many of the friends we've been discussing. That's right. He, incidentally, his son was the Duke of Clarence's lover. I mean, dig that. Uh, homosexuality was absolutely verboten in Victorian England, and he was sending people to prison for 12 years for being a homosexual, and his son was going to bed with the Duke of Clarence. With the Duke of Clarence. I mean, try and get your head around that, because I can't get my head around it. It's, it's perfectly ridiculous. But anyway, so this guy, uh, James Maybrick, uh, was accused of being Jack the Ripper, and everybody said, it couldn't be him, it's not blah, blah, blah. What have we got, three? No, we must have a... But, but we must give them a bit of a chance, but just finish your sentence. I'll just and then, and sentence. then we're going to ask for some questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there are any. But I, to be Jack the Ripper, James, James Maybrick would have had to have been a Freemason. He wasn't. And I searched and searched and searched and finally found out that James Maybrick was indeed a Freemason and he had been extirpated from his masonry in exactly the same way as Michael Maybrick had been extirpated. It's so long and complex, this, that I can't do it in 30 seconds well, when I'm having my ass kicked off the stage. No, you're, no, you're, no part of your body at the moment has been kicked anywhere. Uh, it's simply it's that being we, squeezed. It's simply that we want the lungs of the audience to be exercised, and, and they might ask you some question about an aspect we haven't yet covered. But be, uh, before you ask the question, I do emphasize this is a, an absolutely wonderful read. Uh, uh, um, I can't read what it says on the front page because we banned swearing, but the Guardian newspaper says it's a bloody good read. Ah. Um, who's going to ask Bruce a question? Uh, there are hands roaring to the air. It's like a Nuremberg rally now, but um, <laughs> we'll, what about that lady there with a uh, blue, yes. With Hi, so my, uh, based on the story that, uh, that he's a Freemason and he goes on to kill, and he's a serial killer, so is this sort of a proof on, uh, so on my personal perception that there may be a link between religion and psychopathy? Between Freemasonry and psychopathy? No, between religion. Is, religion. There a, is there a link between... Uh, I think what you're asking is, are psychopaths by temperament naturally religious? The answer to that that's is... I, that's, it, 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 that's, uh, I hasten to say, as a religious maniac myself, that that's a different question from our religious people by nature easy, psychopathic. Easy for me, though, because yes, I'm an atheist. Yes, I know, but anyway... Yes, of course, but of course. course. Any, any obsessive behavior is bound to end up in murder, in my view. And I'd be very careful how you develop over the I next... Know. It's perfectly true. Next few months. No, it's perfectly true, because, I mean, we don't need to go into the many, many occasions when religious people have for perpetrated appalling acts. Uh, there's a gentleman here just beside the microphone. There have been theories that Jack the Ripper was a doctor or a surgeon because of the type, the way he killed, uh, opening the body, etc. The other aspect is, you may say who he was, but what was the motive? The motive. Motive yes. is extremely difficult. The reason he chose the lowest of the low 
of the scum of the earth as he perceived them, of these, of these prostitutes in the East End of the London. He wanted sex as filthy and as low as it could get because his ultimate victim was the wife of his brother who he hated with an intensity that is almost the intensity of a psychopath. He wanted her dead. And the other thing that I hadn't had time to, to mention is that the Ripper, apart from these, these uh, nine women in the East End of London, he killed children all over England. He was killing kids in Portsmouth, in Bristol. He killed how, do you, how do you know that? How do I know it? We've got to read the book. No, no, but <laughs> for those very few people in the tent who haven't read it, how do you know it? Well, I know it because uh, one of the letters that the Ripper wrote, the so-called forgeries, said, I'm going to Bradford, and when I'm there, I'm going to kill a seven-year-old boy as a Christmas present for Charlie Warren. Two weeks later, on the 27th of December, which is the great day in Freemasonic, it was the day when the two fac factions of Freemasonry were united into a Grand Lodge, 27th of December, St. John the Baptist's day, he killed a little boy of seven in Bradford, and he carved him up, cut his legs off, and put his legs under his chin like that in the symbol of the Knights Templars, and then wrote letters about what he'd done in Bradford. Now, the police shut this down completely. There was nothing about this child vis-a-vis the legs and everything, but the letters that were written by Jack the Ripper knew how this kid had been left. And you could only know it if you were the killer. Yeah. Good. Now, um, let's go further back and then we'll come forward. Uh, pass the microphone to somebody near you so we don't waste time. Um, thank you for that interesting uh, uh, topic. And I, I think as interesting as the topic was the interaction between the early Bruce and the rather, you know, proper Andrew. So thank you for that. Um, the question is about, uh, you know, history repeating itself. Uh, do you see a, a scenario where a situation like this, people part of a fraternity could sort of uh, hush up something in, in the modern world? Yes, it actually did happen in, uh, I think about, must have been about 12, 14 years ago, um, a man went nuts in Scotland, in Dunblane, and he shot dead 13 children in, a, in an infant school. Uh, his name was Hamilton. Uh, this man, Hamilton, was recommended, had a firearms certificate, and the police in Strathclyde had said to the chief constable, he mustn't have one. Firstly, he's a paedophile. Secondly, he's an unstable man. He's the last guy who should have a weapon. The chief constable of Strathclyde said, no, overruled, twice overruled. The guy who shot the kids was a Freemason, and he was in the same Masonic Lodge as the Chief Constable of Strathclyde, who later committed suicide, by the way. So there you had 13 children being murdered, and the, and the Masonic connection shut up. I actually wrote a letter to the Guardian newspaper in London about this, and they published it in, in, in the paper. And the reason I wrote the letter was because the judge who was conducting the inquiry into this put a thing called a hundred-year rule on the case. In other words, you weren't allowed to find out what the mechanics of this case were for a hundred years. But because I, I target shoot with a pistol, I'm a friend of the, of the retired chief constable of Powys Police in Wales, and he told me the whole story. It's a Masonic cover-up. There's the There's a lady here with red, formerly of the BBC of the World Service, if I may tell you. Now a great writer but not speaking in that capacity. No. Thank you for that thrilling account. There's a, a troublesome aspect, though, of, um, of the, the myth around Jack the Ripper, and it's almost the kind of the, the glamorization of the extraordinary violence that he perpetuated on women's bodies, and it's, it's very troublesome, and I wonder how you avoided being complicit in that almost voyeurism. It was very difficult. I try and leave the murders alone. I mean, you will find uh, Ripperology books that will devote whole chapters to, they call it Dark Annie, was, was Alice Chapman. Uh, it is immaterial who these women were. I call them, I'm sorry, I call them C's in the book, because that's what he thought they were. They were just, you know. Um, 
anyone, whoever the victim was of this type of serial killer, it's immaterial what they did yesterday, who they were married to, whether they had children. They were opportunistic hits. If you ran into him, you were unlucky, and you were also dead. There's a gentleman on a similar position in a pink shirt, or pinkish shirt, waving a newspaper. And then we're going to do over this side because we've been favoring. So I'd like to know if there are any specific peculiarities about the physical traits of Jack the Ripper and are there any criminological studies based on that character? Uh, uh, well, a psychopath or a sociopath, as they're more likely called now, are uh, usually a very high intelligence, very, very charming. Look, one of the greatest serial killers in America was a guy called Bundy. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, this guy was, uh, was a lawyer. He was rapidly uh, be becoming elevated inside the Republican Party. He jumped into a river in Seattle to save a drowning child. He was one of the most vicious killers, serial killers, killed 36 women at least in the, in the United States. He was as smart as a button. He had an, uh, you know, an uh, uh, IQ level in about, a, about 170 not far off genius level. This guy we're talking about, my, my man, my candidate, was one of the most charming men you will ever meet. He was incredibly talented, incredibly wealthy, and incredibly dangerous. Let's have one more question from over here, and then I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, the time is running out. You, you've made such a compelling case uh, that you found Jack the Ripper. And I just wondered if you think that today, we heard about the conspiracy theories at the time that kept it quiet. To what extent is there still a conspiracy theory today that hasn't perhaps uh, given the kind of publicity that we might expect to your findings? Have you heard of the Chilkut inquiry into the war in Iraq? Nobody has been held responsible for the death of 600,000 Iraqis. Tony Blair, together with his pal George Bush, pulled the cork on the Middle East. And they said, how it works in England, this is what they do. They say, you ask them a question, the authorities, and they say, we can't answer that question. We're going to have a full inquiry. So we can't answer the question. Then they have the bullshit inquiry. And then you ask the question again. And they say, we can't answer that question. We had a full inquiry. And that's how it works in England. Chilkut. Chilkut should have named names. He should have found people guilty. In, in Nuremberg, at the end of the Second World War, we hanged Nazis, war criminals, for doing what Bush and Blair did in the middle. They pulled the cork on it. They flooded the whole of Europe with refugees, which has animated the hard right wing in, in Europe, in France, and in England. And now we've got bloody Brexit. So you can say that Blair, in some ways, subliminally, was responsible for this ridiculous prime minister we now have. Nobody's voted for these bloody buffoons. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry, forgive me. I'm going off on one no. now. <laughs> We've reached the witching hour before he's got I'm just our, getting going now. Our, unfor <laughs> our unfortunate political leaders back in Blighty. And it's, uh, it's 1329, so... I think it only remains for me to say that we've traveled a very, very long way from the alleys of Whitechapel in 1888 to the misfortunes of the residents of number 10 Downing Street in London at the moment. Um, and we, ha we wish the inhabitants of Downing Street, uh, whatever we think of their capabilities, um, a safe journey home. We hope they won't encounter anybody such as is described in this book. Or me. Or you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be even more dangerous. <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much. We were all on the edge of our seats. A big, uh, big round of applause for Jack and the Ripper. I don't know who is Jack, who is Ripper, but you might be knowing better.